welcome back to another tutorial guys as you know we're completing the body system series today we're going to look at the nervous system but before proceeding remember to subscribe to our channel stay tuned aka neurons, tissues such as our spinal cords, organs such as our brain, all working together to achieve a major purpose to transmit signals to and from different parts of the body. So remember the circulatory system and the respiratory system are besties, right? Well, the nervous system and the endocrine system are also besties. The nervous system detects changes in our body and work in conjunction with the endocrine system to respond to these changes. Now our nervous system has two parts, the central part and the peripheral or outside part. The central nervous system is further broken down into the brain and spinal cord while the peripheral nervous system is further broken down into the motor and sensory neurons, cranial and other peripheral nerves. Central nervous system. The central nervous system combines and coordinates information coming from the whole organism. Hence its name, central nervous system. The major organ of the central nervous system is the brain. And trust me, after this tutorial, you're going to find out that you have totally underestimated the capacity of your brain. The brain is responsible for emotions, feelings, thinking, language, communication, the whole nine yards. Trust me. But even though it has such high capabilities, it is also a delicate organ that must be protected. Hence. It is protected by the skull or cranium. Let's take a little look on the anatomy of the brain. It has a unique appearance. It has some grooves, some ridges, and some indentations. Well, the ridges are called gyrus, and the grooves or the indentations are called sulcus. But what is the significance behind these ridges and these grooves and this coil? Well, just like the alveoli in our lungs, just like the microvilli in our intestines, these ridges and grooves actually increase the surface area for neurons to be packed in our brain to effectively process information. Cool, right? Mm -hmm. Brain has three parts. The hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. Now let's go to the board for this part. The hindbrain comprises of the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the cerebellum. The hindbrain coordinates functions that are fundamental to survival, including respiratory rhythm, motor activity, sleep, and wakefulness. The cerebellum is the largest part of the hindbrain. It is located at the bottom of the brain, tucked underneath the cerebral hemispheres. The cerebellum functions in muscle tone, coordination of goal-directed and spontaneous movements, posture and balance, eye movements, motor learning, and some cognitive functions. Medulla oblongata is located below the cerebellum and it is a very small structure. But even though it is a very small structure, it plays a crucial role in our lives. Without the medulla oblongata, we wouldn't be alive. It carries out and regulates life-sustaining functions such as breathing, swallowing, heart rate, as well as blood pressure. The third part of the hind brain is the pons. The pons lies above the medulla and on the brainstem below the thalamus. 
it functions in sleep and arousal dreams as well as our facial expressions the midbrain the midbrain is smaller when compared to the two other parts the midbrain comprises of the tectum tegmentum as well as the basal ganglia the midbrain has important functions in motor movement particularly movements of the eye and in auditory and visual processing it is located within the brain stem and between the two other regions of the brain tectum makes up the rear portion of the midbrain and it functions primarily in visual reflexes the tegmentum is located in front of the tectum and it functions primarily in the coordination of sensory motor information another part of the midbrain is the cerebral aqueduct the cerebral aqueduct is a channel that connects the ventricles of the brain as well as it allows cerebrospinal fluid to pass between them and the primary function of the cerebrospinal fluid is to cushion the brain within the skull and serve as a shock absorber for the central nervous system the forebrain is the largest part of the brain most of which is the cerebrum other important structures found in the forebrain include the thalamus the hypothalamus and the limbic system the cerebrum is divided into two cerebral hemispheres connected by a mass of white matter known as the corpus callosum each hemisphere is split into four lobes the frontal parietal occipital and temporal lobes parts of the forebrain let's start with the cerebrum the cerebrum is the largest part of the forebrain and the largest part of the brain itself it is composed of two hemispheres right and left it functions primarily in the initiation of movement coordination of movement temperature touch vision hearing judgment reasoning problem solving emotions and learning we can also look at the cerebrum in another way by looking at its lobes the frontal lobes functions primarily in speaking thinking memory and movement the parietal lobe functions primarily in language and touch the temporal lobe functions primarily in hearing learning and feeling and lastly the occipital lobe functions in vision and color perception the thalamus and the hypothalamus are also functions of the forebrain the thalamus is the main relay center between the medulla oblongata and the cerebrum the hypothalamus functions primarily in sex drive pleasure pain hunger thirst blood pressure and body temperature and we saw from the endocrine and exocrine system video that the hypothalamus produces hormones that controls the secretion of the anterior pituitary gland the amygdala on the other hand is located close to the hippocampus and it functions primarily in our emotions and how to perceive them in other people the hippocampus functions primarily in storing long-term memories and making those memories resistant to forgetting the pineal gland is a small p-shaped gland and it functions primarily in regulating our sleep patterns now let's look at some fun facts of the brain number one it weighs approximately three pounds wow that explains why my head feels so heavy number two it is made mostly of fat interesting number three there are 100 billion neurons present in the brain that is so cool number four about 75 percent of the brain is made of water number five your brain isn't fully formed until age 25 Wow. Number six, the brain can generate about 25 watts of power. Wow. 
the spinal cord. The spinal cord is a tissue that sits within the spinal canal that conveys messages to the brain and the peripheral nervous system. It is basically a long collection of nerves and cells that starts at the lower part of the brain to the rest of the body. It has four regions, the cervical or neck region, the thoracic or chest region, the lumbar region and the sacral region. Now let's go back to the board to find out how the spinal cord is suited for its function. There are three layers of the spinal cord, the dura meta, the pia meta, and the arachnoid meta. The dura meta is the outermost layer of the spinal cord tissue forming a tough protective coating. The middle layer is called the arachnoid meta. The pia meta is the innermost protective layer and is tightly associated with the surface of the spinal cord. The space between the arachnoid and pia meta is called the subarachnoid space and is where the cerebrospinal fluid is located. Within the spinal regions, the outside region of the spinal cord shows neuronal white matter tracts with sensory and motor neurons. Internal to the peripheral region is the gray butterfly-shaped central region made up of nerve cell bodies. The central region surrounds the central canal, which is an anatomic extension of the spaces in the brain called the ventricles with cerebrospinal fluid. Functions of the spinal cord. The spinal cord has two main functions to carry information from the brain to the rest of the body, to carry information from our body's external environment to the brain, and to coordinate reflexes. The peripheral nervous system. Peripheral. Does that word ring the bell? Outside, right? Yep. The peripheral nervous system consists of the nerves that branch outside the brain and spinal cord. But before proceeding, it is necessary for us to establish some important definitions of term before understanding what goes on in the peripheral nervous system. Stimulus, a detectable change in our body's internal and external environment. Receptor, a receptor is a cell or organ that detects the stimulus and converts it into an impulse. Effector. An effector is a cell or organ that converts the impulse into an action. A response is a change in the organism resulting from the detection of a stimulus. Axons. Axons are the long part of the nerves or neurons where the impulses are conducted. And lastly, reflex action. A reflex action is an involuntary movement in response to a stimulus. Okay, so we're ready to go and look at the peripheral nervous system. Let's go back to the board. In the peripheral nervous system, there are bundles of nerve fibers or axons that conduct information to and from the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system has two parts, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Each system contains afferent components and efferent component. Autonomic nervous system consists of the sympathetic nervous system which directs the body's rapid involuntary response to dangerous or stressful situation aka flight or flight responses. The parasympathetic nervous system functions in rest and digest actions of the body. Another important tenet to the peripheral nervous system is called reflex actions. There are three main types of neurons, sensory, motor, and relay. These different types of neurons work to carry out a reflex action. A reflex action is an involuntary and rapid response to a stimulus, which minimizes any damage to the body from potential harmful conditions, such as touching something hot. 
Reflex actions are therefore essential to the survival of many organisms. Nerve pathway followed by a reflex action is called a reflex arc. For example, a simple reflex arc happens if we accidentally touch something hot as seen in the diagram below. Let us look at the steps involved in a reflex arc. As you can see, the individual is touching something hot. Receptors in his skin senses a specific type of internal or external change, sends it to the sensory neuron, which transmits nerve impulses from receptors into brain or spinal cord. The relay neuron conducts nerve impulses from sensory neurons to motor neurons. Well, thanks for joining us guys. We just slayed another tutorial. Good luck on your CSEC and Kate Biology exams. Thanks for joining us. Remember to subscribe to our channel. Bye.